Mr. please. President of the General Assembly, Secretary General, Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, Excellencies, Ministers and Ambassadors, Distinguished Delegates, Dear Friends. Allow me to begin by sharing the warm greetings of the Prime Minister of the Republic of Haiti, His Excellency Dr. Ariel Henry, who was forced to cancel his participation in the general debate at the last minute due to the socio-political situation in the country. I therefore have the honor to read the statement that he was to give at this podium. I would like to extend my congratulations to His Excellency Mr. Saba Kurisi, President of the 77th regular session of the General Assembly. I hope that under his wise leadership, the work of this assembly will be successful. I also wish to commend the Secretary General, His Excellency Mr. Antonio Gutierrez, for his active work in leading this global organization and for his renewed commitment to the cause of Haiti, despite the many thorny issues and other conflicts affecting the world. I have the honor today to speak before this August Assembly in a specific context, that of major challenges that our states are facing repeatedly challenges that we must constantly address and we must find appropriate solutions for the good of humanity. The UN, whose mission is to preserve the ideals of international peace and security, is the right forum in multinational and multilateral diplomacy to tackle and to overcome these challenges in accordance with the principles of international law and in virtue of the values enshrined in its charter, all while respecting people's right to self-determination. Global peace and security are threatened. I call on those involved in all the conflicts that are causing turmoil and suffering for the citizens of the world to cease fire and to find negotiated solutions to their disputes. Too many victims, too much destruction, too many consequences for other countries, and too much collateral damage. It is urgent that we return to a respect for the common rules of international law and living together. The dizzying rise in the cost of staple foods on the international market has undermined the economy of many countries, in particular developing countries, and has plunged hundreds of millions of people into precarity and food uncertainty. There is a significant temptation for each country to seek to hoard goods so in order to provide its population with available resources. We have seen the results of this behavior in the management of vaccines during the COVID-19 pandemic. During these difficult times, the rule must be solidarity amongst peoples. My country, like many others in the Caribbean, the Indian Ocean, and elsewhere, remains very vulnerable to climate change, to sea level rise, and to natural disasters that are becoming more and more violent and more and more frequent. The path of one single cyclone can nullify the efforts of decades 
of hard work and investments. Sadly, my country has had the painful experience of earthquakes and devastating hurricanes. This is a concern for the countries in our sub-region. And in CARICOM, we have discussed this issue. It is crucial, nay, urgent, that the international community show proof of imagination, self-sacrifice, altruism, this to bring our planet and our respective countries towards a new type of international relations. We are all interdependent, and the problems of one can quickly lead to direct consequences for others. For example, conflicts between two countries, or extreme poverty in others. This provokes significant migratory movement, which can destabilize several adjacent countries or even those further afield. With this in mind, the theme of the 77th General Assembly of the United Nations, a watershed moment, transformative solutions to interlocking challenges is quite apt when it comes to my country. And for me, this is an opportunity to brief you from this podium of the United Nations on the challenges that Haiti is confronting in the context of institutional crises. And also, I wish to speak of the efforts and responses that my government is carrying out to address these challenges and to overcome them. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am speaking at a time where my country is experiencing a multidimensional crisis whose consequences are threatening democracy and the very foundations of the rule of law. This is a socio-political crisis which is compounded by insecurity, which further complicates the situation in the country and weakens the state's superstructure. It remains a subject of great concern for my government and for the international community. Haiti finds itself at a crossroads, one that is extremely difficult but decisive for its future. My government is facing a complex dilemma that must be solved, and this requires the effective support of our partners. For my government, the priorities are to restore public order and security without delay, to, as soon as possible, find broader consensus around a political agreement amongst the most sectors possible so as to reach peaceful governance. We must create climate that is conducive to the holding of general elections as soon as possible so as to return the power to those freely chosen by the Haitian people so as to restore democratic institutions. We must address economic and social issues so as to improve the living conditions for the large majority of the population. Regarding the issue of security and the issue of restoring public order, I won't be telling anyone anything new by saying that the activities of armed gangs have created a detrimental climate which is poisoning the daily life of the Haitian population. This is an intolerable situation which has reached worrying proportions. The clashes between rival gangs have caused a high number of victims amongst the population. This has forced them to flee their homes to escape 
the terror of these outlaws. President, Secretary General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as the head of the Supreme Council of the National Police of Haiti, when facing the complexity of the situation, I took steps aimed at making the police more effective and better prepared to combat insecurity. Within our means, I have worked to build the operational capacities of the police and to improve the working conditions for police. The increase in police operations have led to some good results, which has reduced the abuses of the armed gangs, in particular in metropolitan areas. Nevertheless, much remains to be done to combat and to end the scourge. This was recognized in the last report of the Secretary General, S. Stroke 2022, Stroke 481, which focused on the activities of the United Nations Integrated Office in Haiti, BNU, which stressed that the efforts undertaken by the National Police of Haiti have led to the arrests of several individuals suspected of being involved in cases of kidnappings or murders. The report also recognizes the limits of the National Police as well as the lack of capacity and expertise in BNU as it currently stands and this in terms of the number of experts and the degree of specialization needed to address the unprecedented level of crime in the country. Here, I wish to reaffirm my determination to put away those who wish to maintain the chaos and prevent the normalization of the situation. My government, through heavy sacrifices, has allocated the necessary resources to provide the police with the appropriate means for it to effectively accomplish its missions. The delivery of armored vehicles and equipment that are lacking have been delayed. I truly regret that the orders that were passed to better equip the National Police have been so delayed in their delivery. The National Police is able to carry out their work, but it needs strong support from our partners and it needs appropriate training on the ground with the assistance of partners from the international community to stop this situation. I wish to take this opportunity to commend the Security Council Resolution 2645, which prohibits the transfer of small arms and light weapons and their ammunition to non-state actors and prevents the trafficking and their use for illicit purposes. Moreover, several member states have promised bilateral support to the Haitian police, including financial assistance. For this, a basket fund was created to assist in the police's fight against the violence of these gangs. I commend those governments who have already contributed to this fund, and we encourage other partners to do so. More than ever, we need you to continue to show your solidarity. On this occasion, I wish to express my gratitude to our main international partners who have made commitments during the various high-level meetings on security in Haiti. I thank them openly on behalf of the people and the government of Haiti. Mr. President, 
The circumstances of my accession to the leadership of my country require that I immediately begin dialogue with all sectors of national life so as to build a sufficient consensus around a political accord for peaceful and effective governance during the interim period. I am convinced that honest, sincere, and inclusive dialogue remains the best way to reach a lasting solution to the current crisis. Despite political differences that remain between political stakeholders, I continue to encourage dialogue. Initiatives involving various segments of society are underway and I hope to see them completed in the near future. They primarily concern the reestablishment of fully operational democratic institutions through free, transparent, inclu and inclusive elections, as well as an understanding of our common path towards constitutional reform. Regarding the political dialogue already underway, Haiti calls for international assistance so as to make the process more credible and so as to bolster the, com the trust of those involved. In this sense, I am in favor of the Caribbean community, CARICOM, and the International Organization of the Francophonie, the OIF, provide their expertise and commit at our sides to resolve this crisis with the uh, effective but discreet support of the United Nations. The UN has a significant experience on the ground and must continue to support the political and electoral process, taking into account the realities on the ground and by prioritizing national solutions. I heard the cries of the population and their, uh, the needs expressed by my compatriots who are protesting the high cost of living. It is a constitutional right to protest and to share one's demands in a peaceful manner. However, I strongly condemn the looting, the vandalism, and the attacks carried out against churches, schools, universities, hospitals, and po politicians, economic actors, diplomatic missions, as well as international organizations. I also condemn those who have ordered, organized, and financed all this. Sooner or later, they must answer for their crimes before history and before justice. Those involved must understand that we must carry out policies differently. This is why I remain available and open to pursuing dialogue with all those in the country so that together we will be able to find a path towards reconciliation so as to mend the torn social fabric and find a lasting solution to the crisis dragging the country to the brink. Good governance goes hand in hand with the fight against corruption, smuggling, and trafficking of all sorts. My government has taken measures to do so. Our budgetary discipline and our efforts to properly manage our public revenue have allowed us recently to sign a, st a staff monitoring program with the International Monetary Fund. My government has begun a major reform of the customs sector, which begin has begun to bear fruit and results. This has allowed us to bolster oversight and to proceed to seizing weapons, ammunition, counterfeit money, and drugs. In the process, 
we have seen customs revenue double in record time. This strategy didn't please everyone and we have good reasons to believe that the unrest and the attempts to destabilize the country are retaliation by those thieves who are seeing their room to maneuver considerably reduced. UNODC, this institution of the United Nations, or rather this agency of the United Nations, has uh, provided us with experts who are assisting the Customs Administration in these reforms. They need greater resources to be more effective and contribute to the modernization of our customs system and to the long-term continuity of reforms underway. Mr. President, regarding the issue of justice and human rights, my government was established in a difficult political context following the villainous and tragic assassination of President Moise on the 7th of July, 2021. There must be justice for him, for his family, and for the Haitian people. Here, I wish to commend the statement by the Colombian President, Gustavo Petro, who, at this rostrum, apologized to the people of Haiti for the involvement of Colombian mercenaries in the murder of President Moise. This is a transnational crime involving people from several countries. The investigation is both difficult and complex. I wish to thank all countries involved who are working with us. Several, many more crimes and massacres remain unpunished and assassins remain free, some of which have the nerve to come and show off handguns at the head of the protests being carried out over the past few days. I am also aware of cases of human rights violations, the violations of the rights of peaceful citizens in Haiti. These are the direct consequences of the climate of insecurity that reigns in the country. Respect for human dignity is the bedrock of the fundamental rights of each individual. I am determined to respect the international and regional commitments related to the preservation of human rights. In the same vein, combating Prolonged preventative detention remains a priority. Many detainees are awaiting judgment and they are dealing with this situation. And this is an illustration of the weakness of our judicial system, which must be reformed. In this context, I commend the efforts of civil society and BINU who continue to advocate and contribute to a better distribution of justice in the country. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, contrary to what some of my adversaries are saying, I have no wish to remain in power longer than is necessary. The primary concern of my government is the return to constitutional order and the handing back of the leadership of the country's affairs to those freely chosen by the Haitian people through free, transparent, and inclusive elections. I continue to encourage dialogue so as to find a political agreement to organize presidential, legislative, and local elections, free elections, as quickly as possible. It is essential that the elections are carried out in a climate of security and of social peace. This is a key condition to ensure 
the largest possible rate of participation amongst those of voting age, which is the only way to guarantee the true legitimacy of these new elected and to ensure political stability. I have begun discussions that should end soon with various stakeholders regarding the establishment of a body tasked with organizing these elections. It must be able to quickly propose a timeline to political actors for public consultations regarding the constitutional reform and the organization of elections. In this process, technical support and the expertise of our usual partners will be greatly appreciated. All, of course, while respecting the freedom and the sovereignty of Haitians. President, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, regarding economic and social issues, I often say that poverty, precarity, and a lack of future prospects for our youth are, amongst others, the root causes for these repeated crises in my country. It is important, even during the short time that my government is called upon to assume these responsibilities, that we address the economic and social issues so as to improve the living conditions for Haitians. The lasting solution to insecurity is also linked to socioeconomic uh, development, both medium and long-term development. There is a direct relation between the level of crime and extreme poverty. We must also give hope back to our youth by creating opportunities for stable and decent employment so as to offer alternatives to plan and build their future without being forced to risk their lives in clandestine and illegal travel. Safe and legal migration could be beneficial to the economy, economic development of the country, as indicated in the declaration entitled Partnership for Migration, to which 20 governments of the region, including Haiti, subscribed on the last 11th of June during the Ninth Summit of the Americas. Beyond the sociopolitical crisis and insecurity, Natural disasters are a major hindrance to the development of Haiti. The last earthquake on the 14th of August, 2021, dealt another heavy blow to our national economy. The poor performance of the economy for three consecutive years exposes the country to a significant humanitarian crisis. 4.9 million people or 46% of the population need humanitarian assistance this year. With the support of our partners, the government has been able to render assistance to more than 450,000 people in three zones affected by the earthquake. The damage and the losses caused by the earthquake were evaluated at a, more than 11% of the country's GDP. The government looks forward to the implementation of the promises made by our partners during the International Donors Conference under the auspices of the UN and the government that was held in Port-au-Prince in uh, last February. Insecurity, political instability, natural disasters, all these have greatly contributed to the poor performance of the national economy, which has seen negative growth for three consecutive years. This partial overview of the situation explains the degradation of living conditions for the majority of the population who are seeing their social and economic rights regularly violated. The Haitian population, particularly the great majority that lives in poverty, has the right to a decent life. It is true that humanitarian assistance has never contributed to the development of a country. 
we must create the conditions to attract investment. It is the responsibility of my government to work to improve this situation. We are well aware of this, and we are working on it. President, Excellence, ladies and gentlemen, Haiti is at a crossroads, at a watershed moment in its history. We are working on transformative solutions to address the challenges with which we are confronted. From this rostrum, I wish to join my voice to that of President Biden, who has a good understanding of the Haitian crisis. And we call for, uh, solemnly on the international community, and we ask it to stand alongside Haiti and Haitians. I thank all those heads of state and government of the great family of nations who have expressed their concern about the situation prevailing in my country and who have offered their support to Haiti. Much remains to be done to emerge from the crisis and to move towards the social and economic progress to which the Haitian people aspire. I thank you for your kind attention. I thank the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Worship of Haiti.